Why in the world would a preacher start with the game of Simon Says? Well, because some of you, this is what your faith in God looks like. It's a picture of it. You know the precepts of Simon Says. Go with me here. Simon is God. When Simon says something, you obey, and you obey perfectly. You do everything he tells you to do, and nothing that he doesn't. And if you mess up slightly, you are out of the game. And all the while, what you know in the back of your mind is that Simon is not rooting for you. As a matter of fact, every time someone gets, every time he gets someone out of the game, he's actually kind of like secretly smiling within himself. And for many of us, this is what our faith journey looks like. Uh, Corey, I forgot. I've got a gift card for you right here for our winner. Y'all give it up for Corey one more time. I would throw it, but last time I messed it up and I hit someone. Simon didn't say, Corey. I don't think so, buddy. <laughs> Sit down. See, this is the problem with Simon Says. This is what's wrong with the faith journey. When you approach God like this, listen, now follow me. Listen, that you may, you may be able to follow for a little while. You may be able to do good enough for a while, but it is never good enough and you can't obey perfectly. I'm just joking, Corey. Here you go. Here's your gift. I won't make it. Oh, watch out. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That was a terrible mistake. Um, seriously, so sorry. So uh, listen, uh, this, is, this is how so many of us approach our faith with God. And you want to follow God. I know you, because you're here today, you have good intentions. You want to please God. You want to obey God. You want to do everything that he has for you. And, but even the best ones at the game can't follow perfectly. And at the end of the day, your attempts to please God leave you feeling let down, leave you feeling like you are not enough, leave you with this internal sense of frustration. And in your gut, you have this feeling, surely this is not what faith in God is supposed to leave me feeling like. Surely it's not supposed to be like this. And if you've ever had that thought, today's message is for you. And before we dive in, though, i got to give you a little bit of a context here over a couple recurring themes that you're going to see throughout our text today. And so one of the things I need to give you a little uh, quick education on is that of circumcision. And so in Genesis chapter 12, God calls this man named Abram to follow him, and Abram does and God makes a covenant with him. He says, I'm going to make you a father of a great nation. You're going to have so many descendants. Your name is going to be famous in all the planet. And then in Genesis chapter 17, God comes back and he meets with Abram again. And he has this ceremony to celebrate this covenant that he made with him back in Genesis chapter 12. And that uh, he says again, he repeats the covenant. I'm going to bless you and multiply you and you will become a great na nation. And then God changes his name from Abram to Abraham. And then God gives him this as the sign of the covenant in Genesis 17, verse 10. He says, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So as you can see in these verses, when God is talking about the covenant and also circumcision as the sign of the covenant, you can see how important circumcision, how big of a role circumcision is going to play in the faith of the Jewish people. And so because we care so much about all of you, your campus pastors, Rocky and Nick, are going to be doing circumcision checks on your way out this morning, okay? <laughs> no? Too far? I don't know, maybe. Maybe, maybe that's a joke for the five o'clock service, you know, not, not morning, but afternoon, it's okay. Noted. Uh, no, and so you can see how over the course of thousands of years, like how, how when the Jews were thousands of years removed from this covenant that they made with God, that eventually it, it could stop, that circumcision could stop being just the sign of the covenant and could eventually become the covenant. And that's where we find it in this passage where Paul is, is writing to the Roman church. He's saying, hey, listen, uh, you, you Jews, you've made it all about circumcision to where if you're Jew, you're in. And if you're an uncircumcised Jew, well, then you're not in. It's even recorded in the Midrash, which is an ancient Jewish biblical commentary or commentary on the Torah, on the law. And uh, 
in Jewish belief, the Midrash is just one step in terms of inspiration below, below the Holy Bible. So uh, it said in the Midrash, God swore to Abraham that no one who was circumcised would be sent to hell. Abraham sits before the gate of hell and never allows any uncircumcised Israelite to enter. This is what they believe. Man, if you're a Jew, if you're born into the right heritage and you're circumcised, doesn't matter what type of life you live, doesn't matter what all you've done, you are good to go with God and he accepts you and he would never allow you to go to hell. This is what they believe. And then the other thing in this passage that you need, I need to bring you up to speed on and then we'll dive into the text is the law, more specifically the Mosaic law. And so when God delivered the Israelites, Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, you remember that whole scene in the Prince of Egypt, you know, whenever they walk through the Red Sea on the dry ground, and then they get on the other side of the Red Sea, and pretty much immediately Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, and he receives the Ten Commandments from God, and uh, in addition to re- receiving the Ten Commandments written on stone, he also received 603 other laws for a total of 613 Laws of God governing pretty much every aspect of life from how you worship God to what you eat to what you wear to how you cut your hair. And God knew no one would ever be able to perfectly live up to the law. Thus, the real purpose of the law was to point man to his need for God. And by the time that Paul is writing this letter to the Romans, there's a group of hyper-religious people known as the Pharisees that they actually believe that they are able to follow the law of God perfectly. And so Paul was a part of this uh, pharisaical group before he placed his faith in Christ. And so Paul says about himself before he came to Christ in Philippians chapter 3, he says, In terms of righteousness under the law, I was blameless. I was perfect, is what Paul thought and all the other Pharisees. And so this breeds this idea, if you can perfectly follow God's laws on your own, then why do you even need God? And so they would never say this. Um, But in their hearts, they didn't think that they needed God because they could meet the requirements of God within their own selves. And so in this context, Paul writes this passage, starting with verse 11. For God shows no partiality. Partiality to whom? Well, to Jews, which this would have been so incredibly offensive to the Jewish people. God doesn't care if you're a Gentile or a Jew. What are you talking about? I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, God tells the nation of Israel, for you are my chosen people, my treasured possession. And so you can imagine the Jews as they're hearing Paul say this, saying, what are you talking about? God shows no partiality. We're his chosen people, his treasured possession. God's told us he's going to bless us among all the other nations. And Paul says, no, you missed it. There, There is no partiality. When it comes to judgment, God treats all of man on level ground. It's like... um, a few years back, my kids were attending this private Christian school when my daughter was in, in kindergarten, and uh, they would invite me in every once in a while to come and teach chapel. And whenever I went and taught chapel, I would come bearing gifts. I would bring candy, and not just like cheap little candy. I was bringing like big, expensive candy, you know? And so I would come in, and anytime any kid answered one of my questions, I would throw them a piece of candy. But I wouldn't call on my daughter, you know, because I didn't want her friends and the teachers and all that sort of stuff to think that I was showing favoritism, nepotism to my own daughter. And so I didn't call on her and she would get in the car those days, like, or whenever I would come home here and she was appalled. Like she could not believe like, daddy, how dare you come to my school and pass out candy and not call on me and not give it to me. And I was just like, well, I'm sorry. I'm not going to play favorites. I'm not going to show partiality even to my own daughter. And uh, listen, the Jews were so offended by this. What do you mean God's not going to show partiality? We have a special relationship with God. Well, he goes on in verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. No partiality. Everyone who has sinned is going to be judged. Happy Sunday, everyone. Aren't you glad you came to church, you know? Uh, And Paul's just saying it's... It's the same. doesn't matter if you did your sinning under the law. doesn't matter if you did your sinning out from under the law. If you've sinned, you will be judged by God. And then he says in verse 13, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Meaning, just because you were the recipients of God's law doesn't make you righteous. Hearing the law of God doesn't mean that you're all good with him. Listen, Coming to church every Sunday and hearing sermons doesn't mean that you're automatically in right standing 
with God. It doesn't change your spiritual reality. You have to actually follow the law that you received in order to be justified, which if you do that, if you follow the law, you can be justified. If you put into practice everything that is preached on from God's word, you can be justified. See, this is one of the areas where I've, I've actually come to realize like I've preached God's word wrong. I apologize to you for that. Uh, if you've been around for a little while, you've heard some of my sermons, you probably heard me say at some point or another that you cannot be saved by your works. But that's just not true. You absolutely can be saved by your works. There is such a thing as works-based salvation. Now, the only catch is you have to be perfect. And so if you are perfect, you perfectly follow the 613 laws, including in your heart and your thoughts and your attitudes, because this passage tells us that Jesus judges the secrets in our hearts. So if you perfectly follow the law exteriorly and interior, on the interior, inside our soul, then you can be saved. And some might say, well, come on, that seems a little ridiculous. Is that really the standard? You have to be perfect in order for God to accept you? Well, James said, the half-brother of Jesus, he said, forever keeps the whole law but falls in one point has become guilty of all of it. So you can perfectly follow all of God's laws and standards and you just mess up one time, one commandment, one little sin, and God says that you are guilty of breaking the entire law. And so just like you could win, Simon says, if you obeyed perfectly, but no one can. If Simon is any good at his gig, you cannot beat Simon. There are no winners. You may be the best in the room. You may be better than all the people you're comparing yourself to, but you still fall woefully short in the eyes of God. So Paul continues in verse 14. For when, when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Paul's explaining how God could hold the Gentiles accountable, even though they weren't the recipients of the law. Then he says he may not have given them a written copy of his law on, on tablets of stone, but he has written their, his law on their hearts in the, in the form of, of a conscience. Even people who don't give a rip about God still have a moral code. Now, just for example, I've, I've heard that this is true, um, that even like prisoners in, in prison, they have a certain moral code. And so uh, like if you come into prison uh, that you were deemed guilty of say like hurting children, well then these, the murderers and the drug dealers in prison, well, they don't look too fondly on that, and you better watch your back. That's what I've heard. And so it's like, oh, man, like, kill an adult, no big deal, all good. But hurt a kid, no, you know. So, it, but see, it's because even in prison, there's this moral code. Like, like th this is what Paul is saying, is that they're all are without excuse because he has put his law, he's written it on our hearts in the form of a conscience, in, in, in the form of a sense of morality and right and wrong. And Paul says our own conscience accuses us. So forget about living up to God's standards. Like, let's just put that aside for a moment. What Paul is saying here is you don't even live up to your own standards. And isn't that right in your own life? That there's so many times where forget God's standards and what he says. You're not even living up to your own standards in your life. I mean, I know this is absolutely true for me. I could give you lots of examples. Just one number of years ago, I was going to the gym and got out of the car and I had my baby in my arm and workout bag in the other arm and I opened up the door and lost control of the door and it wound up dinging the car next to me. And I, I knew it dinged it, but I just like trying to just ignore it and move past it. And so I wound up shutting the door, went into the gym and uh, didn't do anything about it. Well, whenever... I was working out. I just started feeling really guilty and really bad about it, saying, you know, Casey, you should have, you should have put a note on the car so if they wanted to fix it, they could contact you. I'd pay for it. That's what, and so I, whenever I got done working out, I went back out in the parking lot and was looking for that car and uh, was going to leave a note on the car, but the car was gone. And so then my conscience really just started flaring up there. 
And so every time I went back to the gym, I was looking for that car. I couldn't find the car owner. Eventually, like a month, month and a half later, I saw what I thought was the car, and I left a note on the car. Hey, like a month ago, I dinged your door. I walked away. I shouldn't have. And so here, here's my contact info. And so they reached out, and it turns out it was, it was not that car. It was a different car. And so I never was able to find the car. Listen, that was one of those things. And that stuck with me a while that I, I just didn't even live up to my own standards. And I could give you a lot more examples than just that. And Paul says, like, listen, your, your conscience bears witness to it that we are all guilty before God. He goes on in verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew, which that would have been shots fired for the Jews, you know, like just Jewish audience. If you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in the darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who have or idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. And Paul said, if you who have received the special revelation from God and this teaching and the law, if you are so special and so enlightened and so spiritual, why don't you follow God's laws in your own life? He says, you are guilty of committing the same sins that you preach against. And as a result, those who are far from God, they're looking at your life. And they say, if that's what a follower of your God looks like, I want nothing to do with your God. Thus, the Gentiles blaspheme the name of your God. Because they th sit through your sermons and they see that you do the same things you're condemning them for. Because they read your Facebook rants. And if that's how a Jesus follower acts and believes and feels, they want nothing to do with your God. And that's why you'll never see me with the Christian fish on the back of my car, okay? Because I drive like a lost person. All right, pray for me. You can help me out. But and so you won't ever see that until that area of my life gets under control. And, just a little funny side note, I recently, for Christmas, I got my wife vanity plates, and so her name is Lauren, and so her car has L coats on the license plates and everything, and so every once in a while when I'm driving her car, I'll have to think twice about some of my skillful maneuvers, you know, and, uh, and then I'm like, ah, now it says L coats, not C coats, I'm good, you know, it's like, they'll just think it's her, and we'll be all right, uh, but no, I mean, I, I tell people to say, listen, if you're going to be a jerk on Facebook, that's fine, just don't let anyone know that you're a Christian. Because people are reading that Facebook post and then they're seeing you check in at your church and they want nothing to do with your God, if that's how you are. If you're gonna be a jerk to your waiter at lunch today, just tell them that you just got done worshiping at the satanic church, okay? Like, let's give Satan a bad name instead of your God. Because why? Because the world is looking and it says that based upon how you live your life, someone who doesn't know God can reach some, some conclusions about your God, God and blaspheme his name. Say so clearly that God is not real. Clearly that God is not good because look at the lives of his followers. He goes on in verse 25. For circumcision indeed is of value if, you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. So yes, circumcision has spiritual significance and weight with God back then in the Old Testament. If you obey the law, meaning perfectly obey the whole law in its entirety, but if you don't perfectly obey all 613 laws, and remember it's not just about the outward laws because Jesus said that if you're guilty of breaking the law in your heart, even if it's not outward, you are still guilty of breaking that law. And so if you don't perfectly obey all of God's laws, then circumcision, your outward symbol, means nothing. And can you imagine how offensive this must have been to the Jews? Because listen, they thought circumcision was central. They thought that circumcision wasn't just a sign of the covenant. They thought that it was 
the covenant. They were leaning on circumcision for generations and generations and generations. Remember the teachings of the Jewish rabbis that Abraham is going to be sitting outside the gates of hell and he will not allow any circumcised Jew to enter into hell. And Paul says, no, your circumcision, if you're not perfectly following the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. And that's not bad enough. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He says, circumcision is nothing. What an offense this must have been. The Jewish believers in Rome. He goes on in verse 26. So if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? So he's not suggesting that any man could perfectly live up to God's standards. He's simply rattling the cage of the Jews. An uncircumcised man who doesn't bear any of the signs of the covenant of the people of God that he will actually, like God will actually approve of him, but he has none of the outward signs. He goes on in verse 27, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision, but break the law. And this is laughable to the Jews. An uncircumcised Gentile, someone who has none of the external signs of the covenant, They're going to be my judge. Do you have any clue how long I've been at this thing? Do you have any clue how many years I've been in church? I'm 65 years old. I've been in church for 65 years and nine months. I've been in VBS every year since then, been serving in the church, been giving all of it. And you tell me that someone who's never stepped foot inside of a church someone who has never done any of the things for God that I've done, that God would actually set them up in a place to where they would be judge over me? It's laughable. But look at what Paul says in verse 28. He says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. And this is the whole point of where Paul is going. Paul was setting us up for this the whole time. Yes, circumcision was ordained by God as a sign for those who have a covenant relationship with him, but it was just a sign. It was never the point. And of course, for us today, circumcision doesn't carry the same spiritual weight for us that it did for them. So it's not our sign for the covenant that we have with God. But we do have a sign for our covenant as well in the New Testament that Jesus commanded that whenever you place your faith in Christ, that you are immediately to be baptized, that that's your first step of obedience. And that is today, that is the sign of our covenant relationship that we have with God. So if Paul was writing the passage today, Paul would say, The same thing, but with baptism. He would say, for no one is a Christian who is merely one outwardly, who's done all the right things, who's checked all of these boxes in the external sphere, nor is baptism outward and physical, but a Christian is one who is one inwardly. And baptism is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. He's saying, listen, if you have been relying in your relationship with God, if your eternity relies on the fact that you were baptized whenever you're five or six years old, or heck, whenever you're 25 years old, or maybe for you, your tradition was different, that you're baptized as an infant, or maybe for you, your tradition is different, that you were, you were confirmed. And so if I were to ask you today, how do you know that you have an authentic relationship with God? How do you know you're going to go to heaven someday? How do you know God has forgiven you of your sins? Well, I was confirmed, or well, I was baptized. Listen, if that is your answer, listen, none of, not all of that stuff is outward. All of it is outward. And Paul would say to us, hey, listen, that's great that you took that that baptism step. But if God did not have your heart, all you did was get wet and baptism is nothing. For God wants your hearts. And if you were confirmed, that may have put your parents' fears at bay, but it didn't save you. And if you joined a church, it might have given you standing in your community, but it didn't save you. 
And Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. It doesn't matter if you've been circumcised. doesn't matter if you've been baptized. doesn't matter if you've walked an aisle. doesn't matter if you've joined a church. The only thing that matters is have you been made new? Are you a new creation? And how are you made new? By giving your heart to God. You place your faith in Jesus. You love him. Scripture says, 2 Corinthians 5, Behold, the, the old is gone and the new has come. He makes you a new creation. God has never been about those external things. Even in the Old Testament where there's all this ceremony and all this ritual about how you were, are, were to worship God. Even in the Old Testament, it's clear like God was not about that stuff. David says it about it, about God in Psalm 51. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will, you will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God has never been interested in religious rituals and traditions and dutiful obedience. God has always been about the heart. He's always wanted you to love him back. That's what God wants from you. That's what God wants. One time Jesus was actually asked by someone who, they weren't, they weren't really wanting to know. They were just trying to trick Jesus. And they said, hey, Jesus, which one of the commandments, out of the 613 commandments, which one is the most important one? What's the biggest one? And Jesus responded back, oh, the most important commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And he said, and the second is like it. And love your neighbor as yourself. Listen, Jesus just summed up what relationship with God is all about. How do you do relationship with God? Notice he didn't cite circumcision or baptism or confirmation or walking an aisle or joining a church or any of that stuff. That when Jesus was asked, what is relationship with God all about? What's the most important thing for me to know? What is the whole point of God's revelation to us in the Bible? It's about just love God. Give him your heart. You see what Jesus was saying in that passage, what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 2 is he is giving you permission to leave the game that you've been playing, that you've been trying to do religious deeds. You've been trying to come to church enough. You've been trying to be active enough in, in the body and in the community. You've been trying to accrue enough gold stars so that on the day when you breathe your last, that maybe, maybe, just maybe, God will accept you. But Jesus says it was never about any of that. God has always wanted your affections and he's always wanted your heart. And if he has your affections in your heart, that is enough. Love God and love others. It's permission to step out of the game. And listen, some of you in here today, you've been playing the game. Maybe, maybe for a long time you've been playing the game. And I'm not saying you're a bad person. I'm not saying that you've had bad intentions. Most likely, you've just been playing the game because that's how you were taught. If someone taught you this is how you do relationship with God. You do these things, you play this game, and God will accept you. And God brought you here today because this message was for you. And said, he wants you to be free from all of that. Listen, because whenever you're playing that game, you will always be left with the questions of, have I done enough? Am I enough? Am I good enough? Has God really accepted me? But listen, God doesn't want you to have that type of uncertainty and insecurity in, in your life. This is about a loving relationship with him. Why did God send his son Jesus into, into the world? Because he so loved the world. And he so loved you. Is always about a relationship with you. Today, you can step out of the game. You can leave all that behind. You can give God your heart and you can be cleansed and you can be forgiven and you can know and you can be at rest and at peace in your soul.